Blog Talk Radio. Uh, again, successful. I didn't jump the introduction from Blog Talk Radio. Hello, folks. This is Thursday, November 5th, 2020, in the middle of a maelstrom, I guess. Um, and not in, talking about males, but the maelstrom. We've got a crazy situation going on in America and the world. A lot of things happening. Uh, my guest host today is... The one, the only, Rebecca Tripp, uh, my my great friend for many years, taught me civil mind control, and is the author of the book, uh, Secrets of a Metaphysical Flight Attendant, and she's just uh, uh, an amazing human who's overcome all kinds of incredible obstacles, and we both found the book outwitting the devil at the same time, and it changed our lives. So, Rebecca, how are you? Did I lose you? Oh, wait a minute. I got to put the microphone on. <laughs> All these little technical oh. jigs. There you are. How are you? Oh. oh, I'm very good. Very good. Feeling good today. I know we're going through a lot of crazy things on the planet, waiting to see what the final outcome is. But I remain positive that good will win out over evil. And the planet, planet is going through a major shift in consciousness. Like that gal that you were just talking to me about who channels higher intelligence. Um, you know, you got to go through a lot of um, craziness in order to purge the, the negative from the planet, just like you do in your own life. You know, you don't wake up until you've gone through the dark night of the soul, usually. And then on the other side is the light, the freedom, being sovereign well, is key. Ab- absolutely. You know, when this whole thing first started, uh, you know, uh, one of my past podcasts recently, we talked about the golden thread, and you and I talk about it all the time, that we really have come here to, to fulfill a purpose, and uh, there is a golden thread. There seems to be a plan, a destiny um, that, you know, our higher selves, that part within us, the unknown, uh, <laughs> that uh, kind of is driving the ship that puts us in places with in pe- touch with people that we can could never imagine uh, that that's the magic of it all. But yeah, when it first started, I just said, Rebecca, I said, this is not just a, a, a battle against a, uh, a disease. This is a uh, life altering conscious consciousness altering event because it's going to present so many people with that dark night of the soul and which they have to be reborn. So well, and the, one of the biggest lessons I learned in life is that there is really nothing to fear if you learn that you have your higher self, the Christ consciousness, to go to to solve any problem that comes up in your life. There's always a solution. So, you know, you can either choose to be living in fear every day of some invisible thing like a virus or whatever's going on. Or you can free yourself and, and stand firm in your conviction that there's always a solution. That's right. And that there's, there's always a higher place to go and uh, a place to, you know, where if you have trust, um, you'll find that miracles will happen. Let me call Tommy. Uh, he was busy a, a minute ago. Uh, let's see if we connect. This is a guy that can certainly talk about the Christ consciousness. Um, Never, she ever decides to pick up the phone uh, because uh, full time he is a, an amazing caregiver. Uh, is it he? Is it you? Oh, we can't hey. hear you. What are you oh. doing? There you are. Wait, you're doing 1030 this morning? <laughs> what you think it was? No, tomorrow? I can't do 1030. No, I thought okay. it was tonight. No, 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 no. Sorry. Um, all right. We'll catch you at another time then. Okay. I'm so sorry. All right. Well, Rebecca and I are on a roll. So this will be kind of like the preview. We're gonna, we'll are gonna, do a great one. You can listen to ours, and then um, you can play off of what we said. Do you want to do tonight? No, I can't because I can only do one show a day. I'll try to set it up tomorrow at 1030. Uh, I'm so sorry. No worries. Go ahead, go back to work, and uh, we'll call you tomorrow. All right, bye. Okay.
Okay, well, well, Rebecca, it's you and me again. Um, we uh, let, well, let's, yeah. So, <laughs> so we get to do. We talked about this for so long about just you and I uh, going uh, going off on what we've learned to date and the last. Uh, why don't you tell me how you've we've done three or four podcasts in the past week, and what we've done is not talk about. Uh, the world situation, but we invited people on with their individual stories. And tell me how, you know, I know how I'm feeling. You and I talk about it, but it's just the fact that we've shifted our attention to these uplifting stories about people who were in the dark nights of their soul, uh, who've now come forward and uh, are living, actualizing beautiful existences. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's been very, very inspiring to hear these people's stories because, um, you know, they're average people. They're not the famous ones like the Joe Dispensas and the Tony Robbins and, you know, the Byron Katie's, which people like to interview. But these are just regular people that uh, maybe lost it all or, you know, they all had their own incredible story to tell. But then it, it turned around because they started to trust that they could pull themselves out of it. And they really, I, I believe, spiritualized their thought. They all had a very, very strong belief that there was always a solution if they learned how to rise above the problem and figure out that the solution, and it, it's kind of miraculous the way they, they attract these solutions. And they prove that anything is possible as long as you trust, you have faith, and um, you're willing to reprogram your mind from being negative and stuck and miserable because um, once we learn to think in a new way, in a way that serves us better by being positive and looking for solutions, they show up. Absolutely. And, you know, but this is, you know, we talk about our, our paths and we've read so many works together and, uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, we find the books and the works a lot of times independently, and but simultaneously. And so we can, it's just a great sounding board for me because uh, when I am reading something, you've either already read it or are willing to read it. And then we get to go back and forth. And uh, just, uh, it's we're able to work it out. It's, it's always great to validate what you what new area of your life you've been you're going through and find out that you're not alone and um isn't that what you know lately we've been talking about all of the conflict and uh, you know the spiritual war that seems to be going on and we came upon the idea that who are the people on the two different sides we you know we have people uh, in the world right now who are trying to create trying to uh, move humanity forward, trying to think in positive ways, create new products, create new ideas, create new lifestyles. And then there's this other side that seems, heck, you know, hell-bent on destruction. And we kind of came up with the idea that the people who have a positive, what I call half, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Uh, you know, how do you see the world? Do you see the world as a platform to create and manifest things and to uh, fulfill your life's purpose, or do you feel hopeless? And so right now it seems to be um, divided between those who have hope and those who are hopeless. So you, you want to comment on that? Yes. And, you know, you and I met because you came to my Silver Ultramind seminar many years ago, and I was drawn to the work of Jose Silva because he had – um, he was kind of like the Joe Dispenza of his day. He started teaching in 1966. And what I've learned from all my years of studying and um, applying the laws of the universe to affect changes in my own life is that we're not taught how to think outside of the box necessarily. And if you're just relying on your five senses to feed you information, you're pretty much stuck in a box because there are no solutions there necessarily. 
you can, you know, try to move, move matter around and move your life around in that way, but you're not tapping into the miraculous side of your life where miracles can happen. The supernatural is natural. You can use your imagination and you'll actually attract things into your life that are beyond anything you ever imagined. And it comes effortlessly. Uh, I mean, you know, Jesus, Buddha, all the great teachers were trying to wake up mankind. And now what we're going through is being called the great awakening because we're all being tested whether we want to be or not because we're being forced through this, you know, pandemic and world situation to find solutions personally and collectively. So that's to me what is creating the great awakening. You're either going to be optimistic and know that there is a good solution coming your way or you're going to cave in and just say, it's, I'm all done, you know, it, well, which you don't have so. to do because you've got amazing powers within you if you know how to tap into them. Well, that, that's, the big, that's the big temptation, isn't it? That's the big, um, big mistake is to think, and I think we're seeing an epidemic of that um, even before COVID, of a lot of isolation, a lot of, you know, what we're seeing is people who are taking a righteous stand that their, um, their way of thinking, their way of perceiving is the right way. And all that does is split, um, split a society, split communities and people. And so instead of coming to what we used to have is more of a common ground, a commonality. Uh, you know, in the past, we, you and I talk about some of our heroes like John Kennedy, et cetera. These politicians set common goals. You know, we're going to the moon. So, you know, um, just by giving a commonality to the Americans that we were going to have a purpose and that's all been slowly eroding you know we you and I talk about um, families coming apart and uh, communities coming apart and that's the big temptation is to think that you alone have to figure it out and so you're missing the higher part that is we are connected um, you know I you know how I always we always talk about it the big awakening for me, I, after studying philosophy and theology at the college I went to, uh, and all of a sudden one day turning on the radio and I hear this guy, Alan Watts, with this beautiful English accent, and uh, the first words, I'll never forget it, he, he said, uh, who do you think you are? And I, I was like, what's this? You know, it's a Sunday morning, I, I know I might have got into some um, some church service or something, but it was him. And he just kept asking that question. He says, where do you begin and where do you end? And in all my years of studying Western philosophy, he was opening up a whole new concept to me. He said, do you end at your fingertips? You know, he said, Western man thinks he's an ego wrapped in skin. And he says, so let me ask you a question. How long could you survive without water? How long could you survive without food? How long could you survive without if the sun fell from the sky and it just turned dark, how long would you survive? He says, so who do you think you are? He says, you are connected to nature. So that to me was the first leap is that, oh, wow, I'm, I'm part of this big, uh, this big thing. This, I'm part of the earth. I'm part of the universe. I'm, I'm totally integral to this. And that was the beginning of my understanding that, you know, kind of humble ways, that I wasn't alone. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I'll let you pick up on that thought. Well, yeah, I mean, my, my first big aha was when I first became a stewardess back in 1967. And I was based in Chicago. And a man taught me that if I wrote down on a little index card um, what I desired to manifest and put it by my bed, thought about it when I went to bed as if it had already happened, and first thing in the morning when I woke up, it would manifest. And it, it worked. And I began to understand that really thoughts are things. We can manifest things into our experience by the way we think. 
And, um, you know, people have been studying this for centuries, really. It goes way back to the beginning of time because there's always been healers and shamans and people that understood how to do these things, think outside the box. But um, most people don't spend much time thinking about it because they're just trained to think at the beta level in the 3D world. And um, they're unable to, you know, step outside the box. But um, that was my first big aha moment. And then bingo, took off from there, and I've been studying it ever since. Yeah, and, uh, you know, again, I think, you know, the we have this, uh, Americans have this cowboy image, you know, that, you know, we go out onto the... Uh, the planes by ourselves and we meant, you know, we create our own destiny. Um, and it's, so there's, there seems to be an honor, uh, to, uh, shutting yourself off and going the lonely route, especially today. I mean, we're seeing so many, we talked about it. Yes. Uh, you know, the other day when I went to, uh, get some work done on my prosthesis and talked to one of the, um, uh, uh, prostitute and he said that he, uh, his wife who was a clinical psychologist and I said wow she must be busy today with all the stress and he said oh absolutely but she works for the VA he said she started her own um, business and she said it's young teenage girls who are in the most trouble right now and again it, it comes back to you know, you know whether whether there were there are good and bad aspects of organized religion, but um, one of the things I think that's been missing since most people today don't seem to go to some kind of religious uh, institution or practice where there's a community and get spiritual training, people are cut adrift right now, don't you think? Well, I think that's part of the problem, but at the same time, I, I mean, I've talked about my friend who went to um, one of the best prep schools in the country, and it's a Catholic prep school, uh, where they have a strong Catholic indoctrination, and, you know, it's taught by monks, but um, after she graduated, three of her fellow students committed suicide, and these right. are children that are having a very privileged education and a very strong Catholic indoctrination and they commit suicide. I'd never heard of such a thing when I was young. I mean, I maybe people, yeah, but teenagers really are very depressed because um, this was even before COVID. But I think without understanding that you're the master of your ship, you're in charge of your destiny. Um, and it's not, be, they're not being empowered to feel good about themselves. Something big is missing, you know, and it, it exactly. gives them a hopeless state in their consciousness. And I think that again, you, you, both of you and I have had, you know, you with your spiritual healing, when you had cancer, uh, you certainly got in touch with uh, the other mm-hmm. side. And, you know, myself included with, you know, losing my leg at the age of 13 and then realizing how lucky I was to be alive and feeling a sense of purpose. Um, but it was always about knowing that there's, we're connected to something just like, Alan Watts was saying, you know, we're not just an ego wrapped in skin. We're bigger than that. And when he's, you know, how many times have we read that our energy fields uh, extend way beyond our bodies? That, you know, the brain, uh, the vibrations from the brain can be picked up three to six feet. And the, the vibrations from the heart can be picked up even further. So we're, um, in fact, I heard this term the other day, uh, um, tuned into something on a either a YouTube or whatever, and that we are truly multidimensional beings. And when you have... Right, yeah. Right, and when everybody's putting pressure in the, on these kids to achieve, 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 so that they fit into society and, and to be doing it unquestioned that they just accept these parameters that everybody places on them, 
uh, you know, without thinking that there's a place to go. I mean, most of them aren't taught to meditate. Most of them aren't taught to go within. Most of them aren't taught um, that there's something bigger than us. Um, and so don't you think that this, this, this sense of going it alone without a connection to your higher part is well, I think big- one of the biggest problems too is um, the majority of people that would come and take my my seminar, which I gave all over the country to teach people how to get down to the alpha theta level. Um, most of them hadn't figured out what why they were here. Why am I here on planet Earth? What is my purpose? And if young people were encouraged to be follow their passions, you know. Maybe they're very artistic, but they're told, oh, you'll never make a living at that, so you better go be an accountant. I mean, this happens to a lot of people. Or, right. you know, so they get into a career that they hate, um, only to find out that they just can't do it after a while because it's not their passion. But um, for some reason, we don't try to help people find what they're really good at and what they're passionate about. We just give them these you know, cardboard copy, you know, education. Right. right. And they spend a lot of money to get them, but they don't necessarily end up happy. Right. Well, I guess we just manifested yeah. something. I just got a text from Tommy Moore, and he can do this, so I'm going to call him. And it was a great way oh. to segue into this because he's going to be one of those that we talked about. Um, that, uh, Hello. There he, there he is. We were just talking about how lucky we are at manifesting things, and we... Uh, we Good manifest- morning. How are you, Tommy Morin? Good morning. Usually when somebody wants to do an appointment with me and it says 10.30, I always assume 10 p.m. <laughs> well, that's because as entertainers, that's when we first we would come come alive every night. Uh, let me introduce well, I just, you. I just, I just didn't know anybody else was up at 10 a.m. <laughs> hey, I want you to meet Rebecca Tripp. Who is a great friend of mine? Yeah, this is uh, Tommy. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? I'm great. Good to hear your voice. You as well, my dear. We uh, we've been talking about uh, a little bit about the world situation right now and the fact that so many people need help. And I'll just um, you know I've written. Let me give you a formal introduction. Tommy Moran is there. Is, is there is there actually is there actually something wrong with the world right now? <laughs> yeah. well, let me introduce you. Let me introduce you right. Okay, go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me, Tommy Moran. It's a Christian comedian. Got to start as a comedian as part of the comedy team Cato and Moran. Back in the day, during the heyday of Boston comedy, with the likes of Stephen Wright, Joe Rogan, Steve Sweeney, Lenny Clark, and others. Along the way, he chose a different path. Now, a family guy living in Southeastern Mass with his wife and two children, he is a caregiver, artist, comedian, community activist, amateur landscaper, bodybuilder, and one of his greatest claims is to have a car his two children refuse to drive in. Tommy Moran. Ta-da-ta, (laughs) ta-da-ta. So... You know, I you've been doing some great podcasts in uh, last, and I, I'll just I mean, refer just, people. You, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, you've done some great YouTube um, things and uh, podcasts. So, um, if any people want to go over and get the full story, the full two-hour story, they can just what go on YouTube and plug in Tommy Moore, and they'll get that background, right? Um. Uh... I don't know if they want to watch uh, the video. There was a Zoom meeting I did with a gentleman by the name of John Parada, P-E-R-R-O-T-T-A. And if you go to him on YouTube, uh, he's got a bunch of them. And and one of them was with me back in August. I think the date was something like August mid-August or late August, I can't remember. And then we did, I did another one called uh, Behind the Funny with uh, two folks uh, out of Rhode Island, a guy by the name of Ace Aceto and another comic named Scott Higgins. And we wound up doing two hours uh, with them as well. Um, so when I say we wound up doing, it's me, myself, and I. I'm, I'm, so, 
you I, I keep thinking mad. every time I go ahead. Say that again. I said you were so mad. You no. are very masterful once you get into that, and it's a compelling story, and uh, on so many different levels, and you're just so um, so articulate about it, so glib about it. It's you're right. It, it just they don't the host doesn't have to do much, and you go off. So uh, you know I we'll we'll encapsulate what those two hours say i'll let you try to give me you know an elevator pitch of you know the amazing and uh, you know it was just an amazing amazing time that we you know we were involved in the fact that comedy just took off during the 80s and 90s and it became an amazing ride and you especially in with the uh, comedy team kato moran were skyrocketing uh, you were destroying audiences. You were getting national attention. Um, you, you, you guys were. I, I always stayed to, to watch you guys. I, I would go on before you guys and would always stay to just see the pandemonium and the excitement and the energy you guys would create. And so that part you can find out in those two hour podcast but the big turn what we're trying to talk about today when we entitled this outwitting the devil at one point right on the doorstep of amazing success in which you talked um in one of the podcasts we could get anything anything you wanted and it wasn't necessarily good things but you could get on a tangible material physical level people were willing to give you anything and everything because of what you were bringing to the world. And then you made a huge change in your life. So you want to pick it up from there? Sure. I one day was uh, invited uh, to uh, go to church with a gal who I was dating at the time. And I pretty much, my immediate response was to do or and the reason would be and she winds up telling me this incredible story uh, about when she was 16 years old she had a friend come by her one of her mom's friends come by her house and shared Christ with her wound up going to a prayer meeting uh, one evening She was a gal who was involved in vocational schooling at the time, taking some cosmetology courses. And if if you remember, well, I'm 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 I I don't remember, but maybe um, Rebecca might. You know, back back in the day, uh, hair product was kind of poisonous. I mean, if you put something in your hair, it was usually not a natural something. I mean, I was the king of Aquanet, and that stuff I used to use for my artwork as well, for crying out loud. You didn't need lacquer. I could use, I could buy it cheaper in a can of hairspray. And so there was a lot of poisons that she would deal with and uh, chemicals. Her, her skin, she's telling me the story that her skin was legitimately peeling all around her hands uh, due mm. to the chemicals that they used back in those days. You know, we're talking, gosh, I don't know back in the eighties. Um, so this, this, this stuff was, uh, that she was dealing with and, you know, sometimes they wouldn't use gloves and whatnot. So she told me this story and and this was a gal who didn't have a mark on her from head to toe. And she tells me a story. She went to a prayer meeting. She was prayed over the next thing she knows. She opens her eyes and there's not a mark on her hands. And we had been dating about a year. And I said to her, you know, this is the story you tell me like two, maybe three weeks into our relationship. You don't wait like a year. You know, you kind of jump on something like this right away. And so I said, all right, I'll go. And once again, the 10 o'clock in the morning, I thought she was talking 10 o'clock in the evening. And so we wound up going to this um, small little service, uh, about 125 seat auditorium. There was like 15 people there, 13 people there. And the, uh, the, the minister at the time said, if you're a visitor uh, and you would like to know the love of Christ, I would ask you that it's a, it's a free gift. You can receive it right now. 
and I'm looking around the room going, geez, I wonder who the guests are. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I, um, I did, I, I, I moved in that direction and in my heart, I, I never physically or verbally said anything, but when he mentioned the word love, it was like the giant gong from the gong show. I just, I said, Oh, wait a minute. I, I've been, I've been looking for love my whole life. And I wound up uh, receiving the love of God into my heart. It was as though somebody unscrewed the top of my skull and started water fountain pouring in more love than I had ever imagined. And it went through my entire being. And my heart was absolutely overwhelmed with such an incredible sense of being loved like I had never before. I, um, I, I can remember hearing in my head a particular verse, which I had no idea was actually a scripture verse. Uh, I will give you a heart of flesh for a heart of stone. And at that moment, when I heard those words, it felt as though somebody was actually pulling out my heart and putting in a new one. Um, I, 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 again, was so overwhelmed at this, at this moment, you know, and this is a, a, at a time, like you said, when I had everything I needed. I, I was not in a need place physically, I, 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 you know, as far as I could have seen. I had um, I had given up some of my vices, so I was living a clean life and about to walk into uh, a stratosphere of entertainment in the entertainment industry like none other. So I had everything I needed. I had the pretty girl. I had the great job. I was living at a clean life. So I, 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 wasn't, I didn't find myself, you know, homeless or living on the streets in the moment of this need. But when this need came and was met in the form of Christ, I, everything changed. Everything changed. And, and I felt as though I, I didn't need anything anymore. And it wasn't until about six or seven months afterwards when I, um, I walked away from the team. And then, you know, really, um, that was kind of the beginning of, of the journey. I'll never forget. I, I, it was about two weeks after, maybe three weeks after. I was doing a, um, I was doing an event, a show, and huge audience, probably I don't know, maybe three hundred, three hundred and fifty people, and I walk up the stage, and out of nowhere, this waitress walks right up in front of me, and you know, it's kind of like, um, um, what the heck was the name of the movie? Now I can't even think. Uh, um, with Richard Dreyfus, um, co- oh, um, yeah. What was the space movie? Oh my gosh, of the third kind, right? Um, oh my gosh, can't even remember. Anyway, you know where the big spaceship comes down and uh, the light beam comes down, oh, I, yeah, and yeah, that's close encounters. encounters? Yeah. yeah, third encounters. Close yeah. encounters, right? Close encounters. So, yeah. so this encounters. light beam comes down over her head, uh, you know, from the ceiling, and absolutely uh, beautiful gal. <clears throat> who I had met before and I talked to and all of a sudden out of her mouth comes, you were fantastic. And I ran for my life. I'm like, where did that, that was not her normal voice. I can promise you. And I ran into my car shaking uncontrollably. And I thought to myself, okay, what the heck was that? And Hmm. You know, there was there were several moments that afterwards where I where I really had to come to terms with, you know, am I going to continue doing the stand up and try to foster this newfound faith? And I couldn't do both. And I really felt as though I was being definitively led to to put the brakes on my um, career, so to speak which of course is not easy to do when you're in business with another individual. And so I wound up staying in business for another six months uh, at his request, 
we wound up doing we so from the time that I had that moment until the time that we stopped we already had six to seven months of working booked work for six nights a week mm-hmm. right every single night of the week for the yep. next six months yep which is unheard of yep but you were, you were in such demand that was we were in I, such demand so I was, I was just the, the it was a phenomenon it wasn't just comedy it was you guys, it was like a spaceship. You know, if you talk about the spaceship, it was like you put everybody on a spaceship <laughs> and you took them for a ride. Yeah. And, and, and it, you made it so interactive. It wasn't people just laughing and clapping or whatever, but they would stand up and they would yell and scream and they would, you know, have to be part of it. So you're right. It, 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 as you say, you, you're not on the doorstep. You, you, you hadn't got your dark night of the soul in terms of the tangible stuff. You were achieving all of that so um so this is a big sacrifice that you're faced with do you follow your you know i go ahead yeah i didn't i didn't um i didn't see it like that you know it's funny you you say that i i just i just knew what had this uh, you know incredible encounter with god that changed everything so when i felt like it was time to wrap it up I didn't. I didn't feel like I was losing anything, because I had just gained everything. Wow. Wow. Mm. But again, to the you know, Rebecca was just talking about the Christ consciousness, and she was we're talking about you know uh, being connected to the other, and this is the dimension that most people don't experience is is that connect that God connection. I'll tell you, it was so so amazing i i remember <laughs> i remember uh guys in the business would come up to me because there it was such a small community you know comedy itself even globally is a very small community it, it's not like the, the 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 numbers in in the world of engineering or scientists you know stand up comics i mean i i guess maybe you could say at that time maybe there was a thousand full-time working comics across the country, maybe 2,000, um, you know, just a tiny, tiny microscopic little community. So, so in, so in town in Boston, you know, when you're a, when you're a big fish in a little pond, everybody kind of knows your business. So the rumors started getting around that, Morin had found religion and young comics would come up to me and and try to ask me for advice. And my immediate response was, listen, man, you just, you just gotta, you just gotta meet Jesus. Cause I, I don't know nothing about nothing. I was so elated, excited. Just my life had just completely changed. And I remember young guys would ask me, so what denomination is it? And I'd be like, uh, denomination. Uh, okay. Let's see. I, I think it's the, I love Jesus. Welcome to our church. We're going to give you a hug when we see you and tell we, that we love you denomination. Is that a denomination? And, um, you know, these guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. And I had just this incredible encounter that now going on 28 years, completely revolutionized everything yep yep and even know, rebecca, even to the point of us having this conversation right now yeah and rebecca has had hers and i've had mine um yeah and and so that you know we we entitled this outwitting the devil uh because that book by napoleon hill helped uh helped me understand things and rebecca to understand things and we were able to talk about back and forth for years now and part of his message in the book is that only about two percent of the population is really awake and you must encounter this every single day knowing that you you certainly awakened and we see what's going on right now 
And, you know, to us, there's pain involved in that and that we're like, well, why don't they get it? Why don't they see it? So how do you, I mean, you certainly, I mean, that encounter with that waitress, with that voice, you certainly, and you, had all <laughs> of, you had all of the temptations uh, waiting for you. Um, all the temptations, yeah. And you decided that, uh, though, I mean, and it was a, it, and this is part of what we've come, and Rebecca, you can comment on it. This, what it really comes to at the end is you have to trust that, um, you have to trust God, you have to trust, you have to make the blind leap, and trust in in, in giving Him, uh, you know, your life. And uh, knowing you know, that, I it's funny, yeah, I I. I you're saying, you know, giving him your life. And, and, I, and that is the key, at least it was for me, was this complete surrender of all that I wanted, all that I was, all that I thought I would be. And I can remember my, my name was up on the marquee in New York at Caroline's. And I would come home on the weekends because I was living in New York and I was living in Boston at the same time. And we're traveling back and forth and I had the opportunity to clean the bathrooms at this tiny little church in the middle of Southeastern Massachusetts along the beach. I, I would be bawling my eyes out with a toothbrush cleaning the grout of the floor in this bathroom and being so grateful that, that God would even come close to entrusting me with cleaning his house. I was so overwhelmed by a sense of gratitude, even though my name was on some marquee somewhere in the middle of, you know, Manhattan. This to me at that moment was one of the greatest opportunities I had ever experienced. And so I'm, I find myself just bawling my eyes out on the, bathroom floor clean about thank you for letting me be here thank you my god you know i was so grateful and uh, it, it was such a different uh universe to what i was dealing with in the natural and so much of what was happening to my heart and my mind and my thinking my actions uh, the people that i was surrounding myself with everything was completely changing and and i think that's what has to happen when we come to a place of, of, you know, at least the, in the beginning to strengthen ourselves, to become, um, you know, the, 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 the reality of what we've been created to be. And it, it you know, it does, it, you're right. It, it, it doesn't happen for everyone. There, there's a, it's a small number of people, um, you know, we can call ourselves with a label, uh, Christian, this, that, the other. I, I heard some of the, the the podcast before you picked up the phone, you know, or we want to call ourselves Catholic or Protestant or whatever title we want to put on us. You know, I, I keep going back to the scripture in my head where Christ is talking with Nicodemus this very wealthy religious man. And he says, uh, unless you become born again, this is out of the mouth of Christ, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And this is a new birth that I was experiencing that I wanted everyone to know. But, you know, with, with, with zeal and with <clears throat> fervor, there's enough people around you going, dude, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm, I might be crazy, but I've never been more complete in my entire existence. And if I'm crazy, then I'm, I'm then label me crazy. But something else has happened. I remember one night being in a club with you and I asked you how you were. And you just looked at me. I'm so happy. And uh, <laughs> I remember, you know, and you're right. I kind of looked and I'm like, well, I know you're happy, but really, that happened. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it kind of blew me away. Uh, and I'm going, well, good for you, but wow. 
you know, what did you just hit the the men's room before and and, and take something to be that happy? But yeah, what's were, going on in the green room? Yeah, but you were high, <laughs> high like I never saw anybody high, and it was yeah. all because of this this rebirth. Um, Rebecca, why don't you tell us what your perspective? It's a fun part about having Rebecca as a co-host is because I know these stories, et cetera, and it's always great to get her take um, because she has such wisdom. Uh, and we're, we're finding that by doing these stories, these individual stories, rather than, you know, giving the, the principles of what it takes to become awakened, by giving these personal stories so people can understand that, you know, your road, your trip, your journey and incorporate that into their lives so they get better. So, Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you for a minute. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can relate to your story, um, and it's, an, it's, a, it's such a beautiful story. But, um, and I think it's important for people to hear these stories because if you've had one, you want to hear what's happened to other people. And mine happened when I was in my mid-20s. A doctor said, um, if you don't have surgery next week, you'll eventually die of cancer because you have early cancer. And he wanted me to rush to the hospital and have surgery. So I went to a spiritual healer who was a Christian. And like you, I felt like the top of my head opened up. I was reborn into a much bigger version of myself. I tapped into the Christ consciousness, instantaneously healed. And um, after wow. that, nothing was ever the same. And you mentioned feeling like water. I felt like water was flowing through my body whenever I would pray in the months mm. after that. It was like there was a, a water fountain purifying the inside of my body. And it was so transformative. And like you, I thought, wow, everybody's going to want to hear about this. But can I, a lot of people do think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they can't relate, so you got to deal with that. But right. I'm curious to find out, after you left um, the, the world of being a comedian, what did you transition into? And so was, that, I, was that difficult? Oh, my gosh. So I... <laughs> So, you know, you make the call and you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm giving this life up. And that was the only life I knew for right. a very short time, three and a half years. But that in that three and a half years, everything you could possibly think could happen in a career happened. Most people, mm. what happened to us in three and a half years um, usually takes a very long time for most people, and especially during a time where there was no social media, this was, um, this was at hyperspeed. So we, when I, when I got done, you know, the, the last day of doing standup, I knew I needed a job. I wound up getting a job at the Lenox Hotel in downtown Boston. As a bellman, I saw this ad in the newspaper and I can remember crying out to God and physically crying, tears running down my face going, I'm so afraid to have a day job. I don't, wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> and I, I walked into the hotel. I had my interview. She said, you can start tomorrow. I went, when you say tomorrow, is that, is that like the day after this day tomorrow? Is that what you're talking about? I, she said, yes, tomorrow morning. I said, great. What time? 7 a.m. And I'm like, 7, 7 a.m.? What is it? A, a.m. That's in, the, that's in the morning, 7 a.m. in the morning. She said, yes. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Is anybody even awake at 7 a.m.? What, do do? what are you doing at 7 a.m.? I didn't know your hotel even opened up at 7 a.m. Most people, it's, isn't it like 9 or 10 or something like that? And uh, she said, yeah, 7 a.m. I said, okay, great. I, I lived approximately three minutes, maybe five-minute walk from the hotel. I was living over on, on Hemingway Street, and, um, uh, near, which is near, near um, uh, Mass Avenue and, and Boylston Street. So uh, not that anybody 
who may not be familiar with Boston would know what I'm talking about, but it was, it's literally like a three to five minute walk. So I woke up the next morning, went to work and, and, you know, consequently would find myself being late for work because I was like pulling myself out of bed to go to work. And I would, I would run up to the top of the street and the main drag is Boylston street from where I live. And I would jump in a cab and I would be like, sir, can you drive me? And I would point, you could see the neon light lit it up sign on the roof of the hotel from where I was, but I didn't want to be late for work. So I'm like, sir, can you just drive me to the, to the, to the, to that hotel? He's like, my friend, that's, you could walk there, my friend. What are you doing? I'm sitting in line. I'm in the cab line. I've been here for 10 minutes. I'm not driving you. It's three minutes. You could, what's the matter with you, my friend? I'm like, dude, I'll give you 10 bucks. If you just drive me to that building right there, I don't want to be late for work. Fine, get in, fine. We, I wound up running that way for most mornings that he, me and him became friends because he would always wind up driving. I go, do you think you can pick me up my house? Don't push it, pick you up at your house. Just get here when you get here. <laughs> so I wound up, you know, having to, having to obviously transition into this whole nother life that I was, I was basically familiar with. I mean, I had day jobs before I started doing stand up, but, but my, my, my life had been so immersed of every breath in my stand-up career. So when I wound up starting to, you know, work at, at and, and, and commiserate with, with people at work and just talk to folks and, and serve them, uh, it really was the groundwork for what I would be doing for the rest of my life uh, on, on top of the foundation that I got from public speaking. Shortly after I started working, I wound up getting – a phone call to speak at the Framingham State Women's Correctional Facility. At the time, it was the only women's correctional facility in the state of Massachusetts. And it was, a, it was an absolute shambles. I mean, it looked worse than the outside of the Adams family house. It was completely falling apart. They were doing construction. It was, um, they, would, they would mix in every population of, of crime with bad check writers, with murderers. It was just crazy, crazy place. It looked like the old West when you pulled into this, in, onto the facility. Well, I got this phone call. Hey, I, we've heard you, you're doing some public speak. You, you've done some public speaking before and you have an incredible story. And I said, yes. Would, they asked me, would you want to be our guest speaker? I'm like, uh, sure. Well, the crazy part is, a year and a, a year or so before that, maybe a little over a year and a half before that, I wound up doing stand up at the same facility. So way before my transformation, way before I met the Lord, I had already been at this facility. Now I'm going back as a completely new individual. It was so hmm. incredibly oh, just the, the, the moment itself was like blowing my tree because I, I couldn't, I wouldn't have imagined that I would ever have been back there again. So when I go back, there's me and 200 women. I have no microphone, no sound system, and there are security guards surrounding the place. It's night, it's, it's evening, and they're wearing mirrored sunglasses. It looked like a scene out of, um, you know, Cool Hand Luke. You know, it was just, it was like a bad prison movie. It was so, so I had to project and I'm screaming my message. The women go to their feet like six times. I thought this is going to be like Attica. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing a Pacino and this is, this is going to be bad. So when it all got said and done, you know, there was laughter, there was, there was joy. I mean, I was able to bring um, just from my own experience of public speaking to be able to intertwine the story with humor. And so I go through a lot of details in my own personal life and some of the very difficult moments that I had uh, before I came to Christ. And when uh, it was all said and done, this little tiny woman, I mean, she must have been at best 4'11", this beautiful um, woman who had this gorgeous 
uh, African American woman, these these amazing white dreadlocks that went all the way down to almost the floor. Um, she comes up to me. She goes, just like this, no exaggeration. Baby, what you did was awesome. God loves you. God will bless you. I'm just like, how do you have that voice? You're as tall as my kneecap. I don't. It doesn't. She sounded like one of the little guys from the Rascals. And. <laughs> I said to her, um, what are you here for? She goes, double murder. I killed a man twice. I'm just kidding. Ha <laughs> ha. So I'm like, oh, okay. I killed a man twice. That's a... So the, the story goes that she actually wound up being, she was being abused by her, by her husband and her husband's brother. And out of, out of survival, finally, she, she, she legitimately pulled the trigger. She killed them both. So she was in jail for a double murder, even though it was self-defense. And um, she grabbed my hand and she just spoke this blessing over my life. And that was it. And she wound up, you know, I wound up leaving. And the next thing you know, I find myself um, having these offers of doing public speaking and going out and speaking to people about, um, you know, abuse and, and uh, substance abuse and some of the things that I had, uh, you know, indulged my, my own personal life in. And I wound up within a matter of probably after that, a matter of weeks uh, doing intervention with a dear friend of mine and his wife for my friend. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go the way we had hoped it, it would. But then that was a... Dom, the domino effect after that was I wound up doing many interventions, speaking to people about uh, different abuses uh, and working with troubled youth. I never would have seen it coming in a million years. And so that has been part of my story for the past 28 years that I continue to uh, be reached out to. People will find that there's nothing out there. I mean, I don't, the only social media I, I have is LinkedIn. So if you if you go to Tommy Morin on LinkedIn, that's it. I, I don't do Facebook, Twitter, Insta, none of it. But I, I still, even to this day, will, will get phone calls from across the country. I, I had one uh, about a year ago or so from uh, Philadelphia, and then there was another one from L.A. People calling me because somebody knows somebody who knows somebody. Can you help my brother or my cousin? And we do a bunch of phone interventions over the past uh, 28 years and also doing, um, I, I worked at a, a rehab center for a while. So I was able to do some public speaking there and, and through it all comedy has been um, the, the, the platform, I guess, so the bridge to, to build to something else, to a, to a message. So usually when people ask me, you know, what, what is it that you do? I, I say, well, I'm, I'm a comedian or a speaker who uses stand-up to build a bridge to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so being able to give the message of hope um, like never before, even during this time, really seems to be, you know, what, what, what otherwise would be called perfect timing. And so uh, I have a part of a particular ministry called Laughter and Hope. So I bring the laughter. We, we did several prison events uh, last um, September in through November and December. We were getting ready to do six more prisons in January and February. And right as they, they were going to, we were going to send out emails and, and dates. We had um, six prisons. Um, most of them were maximum security. And then another one was, uh, federal prison down in Massachusetts and uh, and then the COVID thing you know happened and, and all that got put on hold but the the, the most awesome um, for me was was really one of the one of the first ones and, and that was at Plymouth House of Correction in November no December December and um, we had two basketball court size uh, facilities. Uh, the, the, the unit was the size of two basketball courts. 
this giant open space with a balcony that wrapped around the, the, the second tier of the facility and 70 guys and they're all spread out. Like there's guys in front of me, there's guys behind me. And I bring in two other gentlemen that I work with, have worked with in the past. One guy's a comedian and another guy is a minister out of a chaplain out of Rhode Island. So again, no electrical equipment, no microphone, no sound system, nothing, just project. And it's this huge, massive space. And you talk about work in the room, they're spread out and they're behind me. So it's, it's like, you know, walking around, it almost feels like one of those rotating stages. And I feel like Engelbert Humperdinck, you know, just like I'll <laughs> let the stage do the work because I'm too old to do it myself. So I wound up um, speaking, and of course, I brought the, the, the was allowed to bring the, the humor, and the humor was received, and it was awesome. The response from these people were just amazing. I was able to um, to really to really have this this moment of of okay, God, this is something I never would have expected. In 28 years, you continued to surprise me. And because I love the surprise and the surprise comes when you you're not looking for it. And so many times I have looked for it over the past 28 years, believe me. Um, you know, you try to resurrect something that happened before in my, my previous life. And it's just every door was completely shut. And I've traveled back and forth to L.A. and New York uh, trying to, you know, look at God saying, you're with me on this. Right. And and God's kind of sitting on the side like George Burns going, I don't believe that I actually told you this is what I wanted you to do. So that was the old God reference. So, uh, um, so I wound up just, you know, being completely blown away. And then the following day after Plymouth house of correction, legitimately there were three emails wanting us to come and participate at um, uh, Norfolk, Suffolk and Middlesex. Well, the following Monday, that was on a Saturday. I didn't even know, you know, prisons did emails on Saturday. So the following Monday, I got another three emails. And now there's all these connecting pieces. And I'm just like completely blown away. Really, um, you know, as though it couldn't get any better than that. Um, you know, they're going to pay me as well. So I'm like, wow, this is insane. This is so amazingly cool. And the 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 you know as i'm as i'm sharing and i'm speaking you know th these guys were were just glued e even the staff members um everybody was just it just seemed like they were just hanging on every word and i'll never forget this um muslim brother came over who was giving me the stink eye the entire time and every time i talked about jesus christ and dying on the cross and forgiving of my sin he was just giving me this 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 stink eye just this look like if if he could he'd be he ripped my head off and he come up comes up to me afterwards and says i cannot thank you enough for what you just gave us and i was like wow i'm like dude if i could i'd hug you right now well i couldn't hug him because i didn't find out till afterwards we were in maximum security we were in the worst unit in the entire facility. Whoa. And I'm, and I, and I remember looking at one of the, one of the directors and I said, I am so glad you waited to tell me now and not up front. Thank you so much for not adding the pressure of being, you know, the next, the next Johnny cash in Folsom prison. I really appreciate it. So that's kind of been part of, that's, that's kind of been part of the journey. Go ahead. Mm. No, that's, well, that's, no, well, that's, that's a great story. Really exciting. Well, in the fact that, you know, this is the wonder of it all. I loved it when you said something similar to that, the, the, the uh, amazement or what, what uh, how did you term it? Uh, you know, the surprises. surprise. Yeah, you know, and I, I've had people say to me, well, what, well you know, you, you get these miracles, and why, why are you excited about them? I says, I can't believe not getting excited about it. I can't ever even conceive of not being in a wondrous state and just saying, 
wow, wow, that was a great, you know, I started as a magician and, you know, I saw people go crazy when I fooled them or tricked them and they saw magic. And, and myself, when I saw great magicians and I just had, would be like a little child and the sense of wonder. And when you make this jump and w- what I heard through this whole story and Rebecca and I talk about this a lot, once you make that decision to, to trust and to surrender and think, Things will happen, as you're saying, that you, your ego, your intellect, could never have possibly imagined. Could never have imagined in a million years. You know, here, and, and like I said, what, here, here is the, um, you know, the first invitation to do public speaking uh, back in 1990, almost 93. And I had stopped doing stand-up in the summer of 92. So we're going like midwinter, almost the beginning of the year when I first got that, when I got that invitation to speak at the women's Framingham women's facility. And, um, how, how do you orchestrate that? I was there a year and a half before that, before I had become a follower of Christ, my heart completely overhauled how you couldn't possibly arrange that in, in, in any scope of imagination. You know, when I was there, when I was doing stand up the first time I got there, I just wanted to get a check, make them laugh and leave. And that was the end of it. And here I am now a year and a half later telling them I was here and there was a, a lot of people there who remembered me. And now I have this message I want to share with you. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, and, and believe me when I tell you, funny is funny. You, you slip on, you know, the, the, the three stooges slipping on a banana peel, it's funny. You know, Abbott and Costello, it's funny. But for me and the calling on my life, the funny is now a bridge to something else and so not that not that you know when i tell a funny story it it, it doesn't have it's not necessarily this um spiritual or connected or you know religious themed part of the humor but it's for me the the greeting card or the calling card to what the greater message is for me in the calling that's on my life. So it, uh, so the funny, when the funny hits, it, it's, it's the open door for me to then deliver the message. Um, you know, if you, you're, you're at maximum security and they say, here's comedian Tommy Morin and I don't deliver the funny. There's no, nobody's ready for the message. It's not, right. not happening. Right. I might as well have been introduced as, you know, would you please welcome our guest today, surgeon and brain psychologist, Tommy Moore. It would have been the same thing. You know, it's, what's funny about that? And so, um, so, so much of it too. And, 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 you know, this Tommy, and when a comedian is trying to find quote unquote, find their voice or actually any public speaker, is trying to find their voice. Um, it, it's to be able to to stand in front of a group of people and to express the essence of that calling according to what you've been created to do. And so I find that for me, um, especially when I first started off doing stand-up, we didn't even have time to find our voice. There, there wasn't even there was there wasn't enough moments in the day to find our voice. We were just going up on stage and just throwing the spaghetti against the wall, and if it stuck, then it was ready. But if and and if you're not Italian listening, you don't know what I just said as far as the reference. So, but that's I remember my grandmother used to take the spaghetti and throw it against the wall, and and if it stuck, she'd be like, "Dinner's ready." So, um, but. But so now, you know, here we are, for me, 28 years later, and the, the voice was, 
was already beginning 28 years ago as far as the calling. And so the, the voice needs to sometimes catch up to the calling. And so here I am having this interview with you, and especially the past few interviews that I've done. Uh, it took me 28 years to be able to share what I'm sharing today. I, wow. I, 20, this, this interview was 20, right now that we're having, for me, is 28 years in the making. Wow. I, I never would have had this interview 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I wasn't ready. Amazing. And so here we are now, almost 33 decades later, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Well, you know, I'm getting goosebumps with this. And Rebecca, it, it, again, it's, it, Rebecca, go ahead. I'm going I'm to shut up for a minute. You give me your take on this. Well, I love what you just said. I mean, I, that's very empowering because, you know, you're a work in progress and we all are, but, um, you know, people need to be patient too with themselves and realize that if they listen to the Christ consciousness and they let God guide them, they'll be led to the most amazing situations that you never could have imagined. And I love the way you describe what, what's happened to you along the way. It's, it's very, very enlightening. Well, well patience you. is not, is not my, uh, it's a <laughs> gift that I do not have right now. It, I never have. So when I, when I put the brakes on, it is um, usually after uh, a, a bit of a struggle. And, and that's really when I find and, going back to the, the, the topic that that you guys were discussing earlier and, and, and the, the, the title of this podcast, that's really for me when the enemy comes in or Satan comes in and, and uses that against me when I'm when I don't have that patience working through me. In Galatians it says that the fruit of the spirit, one of them is patience. And and the final one mm-hmm. that the scripture says in Galatians chapter five verse twenty two is temperance, which is the surrender. You know, I find the patience only in the continual surrender. And this is daily. You know, this is, a, this is not like I do it at the beginning of the week and hopefully it runs for the next 10 years. This is a daily in and out of the relationship and the communication and understanding, okay, God, where are you guiding, leading, directing so that I'm, I'm, I'm moving in accordance to, you know, what it is that you want for me. And so Mm -hmm. as I'm patient, that that's only through the surrender. It it definitely doesn't just, I don't wake up one day and go, you know what? Today is going to be a patient Tuesday. I can feel it. (laughs) I just know it's going to happen. And that's just not the case. But when that, when there isn't, when the patient is not part of the, let's say the long board of, of the wave coming in, I am completely tripped up and, and it is a trap. It is an absolute trap when there is no patience, when we're, when we're muscling our way to, from a to B, cause I have no, no strength in myself. Paul says over and over again, I die daily. I must decrease so he can increase. If, if that's not the case in my day to day, Listen, I hear from my kids. I got a 14-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son, and they know right away. I walk out of the room, out of my bedroom. They know right away. They go, Daddy didn't take his Jesus pill. You know, they know right away. So I, 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 don't, even, I don't even go into the kitchen. I, just, I walk backwards back into my bedroom and go, you're right. I'll be back. It's so funny. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, yesterday, you know, and and especially during this time of of all the stuff that they've been unfortunately privy to see, um, they, my son was asking me about, you know, the law and some of the things. And and he actually said to me, Dad, what would that, what what is it like? I mean, what, what would it be like for if people just broke every law. And I said, 
let me tell you something. You're never going to know this guy that I'm going to tell you about, but, but the man that I used to be broke all the laws. I broke laws when I drove. I broke laws when I dealt with people. I broke laws when I dealt with business. I, I broke laws because they meant nothing to me. And so when lawlessness is, you know, is done really in accordance with godlessness, when they, they walk hand in hand with each other, there is no barometer. There is no, there is no, um, there is no holding back or, or, or reserve in our actions or in our speech or in our dealing with other humans. When, when, it is, when it is minus God, then anything goes. And, and, and that is only the, 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 the prize for, for that or the end result is nothing but pain. And my son looked at me and he said, wow, Dad, I, I am so glad you're not that person. And wow. I said, yeah, me too. Wow. Me too. Wow. And then he well, asked, and then he asked about, and then he asked for the car keys and I wanted a thousand dollars to go to Vegas. <laughs> wow. You know, um, Rebecca and I, before you, you know, in the last couple of podcasts have just felt so uh, lucky, so grateful that we decided that we've been led down this path, you know, all of the, the encounters that Rebecca and I have, and we decided, hey, let's let's be a little proactive. Why don't we, you know, and again, we're not, you know, we're not interviewing, you know, <clears throat> Clint Eastwood or whatever. We don't, we, we want, we wanted the real story of what's going on with all of the smoke screen and the insanity of what's going on and get down into the mm-hmm. heart of people and with these stories and you just, I mean, this last five minutes of what you're saying about you, you brought it completely around that this godlessness of what's happening right now, this, this all of us, this is because we're saying that people aren't connected and here you, you sum it all up right there. You know, if you don't have that God connection, that I connection and, and you around helter skelter you've got lawlessness and you've got godlessness it's huge it yeah if there's if 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 it you know when when it's the minus in our existence you know i i well rewind let me rewind so i was at um at one of these muff, uh, muffler oil change places and I'm sitting there and I'm getting my oil changed and I'm talking to this kid next to me, young kid, 21 years old. This is like two weeks ago. And he says to me, and I, and I said, oh, you know, we just got to talking. And then he, he says, oh, yeah, I was, I was just in an accident. And I, I rolled over my Jeep five times. I said, what did you do? He goes, I kept my eyes open. <laughs> I'm, like, oh. I'm like, you're kidding me. He goes, no. I held on to the steering wheel and I just kept my eyes open. I just watched myself roll five <laughs> times. And I'm like, you must have been like, did you cry? Oh, God, he went, no. And he said something else. And I said, oh, I said, well, at, when you're done, do you, do you like, could you possibly think like there, there is a God, I'm alive. He goes, I, I, I'm not sure. I wasn't <laughs> sure. I just was like, I couldn't believe what just happened. So I said to him, I said, do you know? Do you know how much God loves you? Do you do you have any idea? And he said to me, I do. And I said, how, how do you? What's your answer? He said, because he made me. Wow. And I said, I said, now 21 year old kid, he's the millennial. And I said, um, I said, you're, you're, you're definitely going in the right direction. But, but, but that's not, that's not the, that's not the final answer. <laughs> he said, what is the final answer? I said, the final answer is scripture is clear that it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son <clears throat> to die a horrible, horrific, 
death on this disgusting, putrid, bloody cross for our sins that whoever believe in him, following him, not just belief, but to follow would have everlasting life. Isaiah 52 verse 14 says that he was so horrific looking. He looked like a monster. He didn't even look like a human being. He was beaten and marred so bad. And then I showed him this picture that I had, I had done an illustration I had done many years ago. And I said, um, I said, this is, this is how you know God loves us. And he said to me, 21 year old kid. He said, wow, that's, that's really hard to believe. And I said, it is, it is very, very hard to believe. It is not an easy switch, but it is an absolute truth. And he looked at me with this incredible look of gratitude as he's pulling the mask down and we're six feet away from each other. And he says, I can't thank you enough. And there is an absolute eager desire like never before for our generation. And I don't mean generation like, you know, the boomers against the millennials. I'm talking about the moment now, this moment, 2020, and every living organism, every human that is breathing right now, this generation, to know an absolute truth in the in the pandemic of lies in the wow. pandemic of lies wow. because that's the real pandemic is that there is so much so much faults on a global scale from every nation that unless we're in it you know unless you're just rolling up your sleeves and you decide one day you know what? I, I'm going to do something crazy. And, and, and that looks like this. And from the crazy, you say, I'm going to serve. I simply want to serve my fellow man with nothing in return. Nothing in return. No payoff. No big payday. No write the check out to me at the end of the night just to simply serve. Jesus did it over and over and over until ultimately, ultimately at the foot of the cross. But when he rolls up his arms, his, his sleeves, and, and he gets down on his knees and he starts washing feet, the most disgusting, putrid, repulsive job at that time the most disgusting job in the entire household was to wash feet. And he winds up doing it. And in order for him to be able to demonstrate, you know what? I'm leading you, but I'm leading you in service. So that the greatest leader is actually the greatest servant. Because if you lead in serving, others will follow to serve as they lead others in serving as well. And I think oh. for me, I wow. think for me, that's, that's, that's my calling. And it, and it happens to. You do. And you practice it every single day. And that is, uh, go ahead, Rebecca. I can't talk right now. It's so profound. Oh, it's, it's great <laughs> to hear about a transformed life, you know, and, very, very inspiring. But um, I'm sure you made a big impact on that young man that was sitting there. And um, he was meant to meet you. There are no yeah. accidents. No, no accidents. Because that was the, the second thing. time. That was the second time I was there in two days. Yeah. So the, the two days before that, they were changing my oil. I went back. I had to go back because the oil was leaking out of my car like a sieve. On my way back there, you're going to love this, Rebecca. Ah, so perfect. Are you ready? Yeah. On my way back there, I'm driving there thinking to myself, you want me to go back there to say something to someone. Wow. That's that's why I'm going back. 
Wow. Wow. Because that, 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 what happened to me as far as like the oil change and the leaking oil has never happened to me ever, ever in my life. And mm. I'm driving back there going, I know you want me to go back here because there's someone I need to talk to. Unbelievable. That was my exact thought. Wow. When I get well, there, nobody, nobody is there. There's not another customer there except me. Unbelievable. Until from the time I got there until the time I left. Unbelievable. Well, Tommy, mm-hmm. we got to wrap it up. We could do this all day long. Oh, okay. Please. Yeah, well, we could do it all day. Will you come back? Will you come back? I would love to come back. I would love yeah. to come back. What do you think, Rebecca? Should you come back? Oh, yeah. I'd love to hear more. This is very, very uplifting. I love it. What an yeah. absolute joy to meet you, Rebecca. Well, it's great to meet you. And, uh, Tommy, thank you. This was profound. Um, I'm speechless. I just couldn't believe that it would work out. These are nuggets. I'm so proud of the work we're doing and hoping that people we we do connect with start to have the hope. And, I mean, how do you sum it up any better? Is just get your head out of yourself and, and go out and just serve somebody. Say hi. Right. Say, you know, you, you, I remember you telling me years ago, well, just give somebody a glass of water. Um, right. And, and, you know, I mean, I remember going, last year I was doing cruise trips and I had to take a ferry over to Block Island. And this young gal sitting beside and she just offered me a bottle of water. And I, I was just so touched by that because it's so rare. And, and you know, I'll probably never forget her for something like that. So again, thank you, Tommy. This was You're very beyond welcome. Expectations, beyond expectations. And and I you, hope you I can I just can I just say one one quick oh, yeah. one last thing. In March when this whole thing unrolled, um I was wearing a surgical mask. And you know, the tension in the shopping wherever you went was you could cut it with a knife. I mean the fear that was gripping everyone you could cut it with a knife and so i have the surgical mask on i'm in the store everybody's afraid to even look at each other i'd make this i i just had this moment this incredible epiphany with the mask i asked the gentleman do you have a sharpie i went to my car i drew a smiley face with teeth, so big, big smile with big giant Clydesdale sized teeth. And I walk back in the store and the first person who sees the mask says, oh my gosh, I love your mask. Thank you. (laughs) Just like that, word for word. (laughs) And the fact that she said, thank you, I went, okay, God, you are doing something right now. My my minister um, at our church, had, had spoken a message a week before Easter and said, what do you have to give? What do you have to give? And I went, Lord, you, you gave me the comedy. I'm going to give it with no, with no holding back whatsoever. And, and, and I'm just going to give the comedy. I'm not even going to give the message. For the first time, I thought, I'm not going to give the message. I'm just going to give the comedy because right now we need to laugh. Yes. And so I I started putting that on all my masks, you know, the disposable ones. And everywhere I went, it changed the atmosphere. Amazing. Yes, it one, does. One day, one day I walked in and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to put God's God, smile because God loves you. So I wrote that on the mask. <laughs> I wore the mask. I wore the mask into the store. And I could feel the angst. I mean, the literal daggers and angst of people looking at me. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's definitely the devil. There's no way. That's, that's the enemy right there. That's just the devil not liking God's name. And all of a sudden, I heard in my heart, I didn't ask you to do that. I asked you to just do a smile. And I couldn't get out of that store fast enough. I told it to my wife. And she said to me, she said, I, 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 I could see 
how that, how that would happen, how God would say that to you. And so I continue to do the mass. Well, lo and behold, I come in third in a mass competition locally. Yep. yep. And um, it was on the know. news. and right. I didn't even know it. It was on the news. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm on the news? Well, how did that happen? And um, it was just, you know, it's what we have to give. When we give in the serving of what, what is already ours, it's already ours. So many times we look at, like, what do I have to give? What do you mean what do you have to give? It's right in, your, in front of you. When that, when that moment happens where we give in that service, it changes everything. Mm. So, so profound, so beautiful. Uh, Can I, and, and let me just close on this. A penguin walks into a bar. He says to the bartender, have you seen my twin brother? The bartender looks at the penguin and says, what does he look like? The penguin <laughs> looks at the bartender and says, thank you, Detroit. Good night, everybody. Don't forget to tip your bartender to the waitress that they're working hard for you all night. Kiwanis Club, you've been fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next year. <laughs> that was Tommy Warren and Rebecca Tripp, Tom Hayes. Thank you for tuning in. I hope uh, that was the most, most transform, transformational programs I've ever heard and I hope that you come away with the same experience. Thank you folks. Uh Tom Hayes and Rebecca, any last words? I'll give you last word. I guess Rebecca Well it? it was great great meeting you and um I think that I think he's gone so can't wait to Oh no I'm replay. here. I thought you were giving Rebecca I thought you oh. were giving Rebecca the last word. <laughs> I just oh, okay. did. All right folks <laughs> That, 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 that's it. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. <clears throat> Honey, sweetheart.